This past week was one of those weeks when the lectionary had more tantalizing readings than I thought I could reasonably deal with in a reflection of no more than 12 minutes, so I didn't even touch a couple. Deuteronomy 34 tells of the death of Moses, round, rounding out the Exodus story from Egypt and the wilderness wanderings and the giving of the law at Sinai. It concludes the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures known as Torah. Next up will be Joshua, both the leader and the biblical book, and the actual arrival at the promised land. The 12 verses that make up this final chapter are revealing because they tell more than the matter-of-fact demise of Moses and his abiding stature for posterity. It ends, never since has there arisen a prophet in, the, in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. He was unequaled for all the signs and wonders that the Lord sent him to perform in the land of Egypt against Pharaoh and all his servants and his entire land, and for all the mighty deeds and all the terrifying displays of power that Moses performed in the sight of all Israel. The verses suggest many specific questions about Moses, as well as general questions about leadership and succession. Some of those questions are, what do people expect of their leaders? And fair's fair, what might leaders expect of their people? What does it take for a new leader to pick up where a predecessor leaves off? Why didn't God have Moses cap his life's work with actually crossing into the promised land? Moses, you remember, is, lives to the, the age of 120. And when he died, it sounds like he's pretty old, but the Bible remarks his sight was unimpaired and his vigor had not abated. So, advanced age did not disqualify him from doing the job. What was it then? Unequaled signs and wonders and working relationship with the Almighty notwithstanding, Moses was reprimanded back in Numbers chapter 20 after not following the Lord's instructions to command a rock to yield water in front of the people. In the Numbers incident, many years after the prior water from the rock in front of everyone incident in Exodus 17, Moses strikes the rock with the staff, which God told him he should have on hand. And Moses also says some kind of crabby things to the people, you rebels, he calls them. The previous time in Exodus, the bang the staff on the rock method was what God had instructed. In Numbers, though, God tells Moses that he should have the staff on hand, but command verbally the rock to yield the water. Now, thousands of pages of commentary over the millennia have been devoted to the question of what was really so wrong with what Moses did there, bad enough to keep him from completing the journey into the promised land. At this point, I have to say, God only knows. But Jonathan Ta Sachs, the emeritus chief rabbi of the United Hebrew Congregations of the Commonwealth in Great Britain, provides some insight in a piece from 2013. A figure capable of leading slaves to freedom, writes Sachs, is not the same as one able to lead free human beings from a nomadic existence in the wilderness to the conquest and settlement of a land. These are different challenges, and they need different types of leadership. Indeed, the whole biblical story of how a short journey took 40 years teaches us just this truth. Great change does not take place overnight. It takes more than one generation and therefore more than one type of leader. Moses could not become a Joshua just as Joshua could not be another Moses. The fact that at a moment of crisis, Moses reverted to an act that had been appropriate 40 years before showed that the time had come for the leadership to be handed on to a new generation. It is a sign of his greatness that Moses too recognized this fact and took the initiative in asking God to appoint a successor. Thanks to Rabbi Sachs for that. 
We are told that Moses had laid hands on Joshua as his designated successor and that the Israelites obeyed him. You may remember that Joshua went way back with Moses. He and Caleb were the only two among the 12 men appointed to scout out the promised land who came back with a positive report. And that was way back in numbers when Joshua already had a strong resume. God's chosen leader had thus been doing a long internship of sorts and was recognized and accepted by both his boss or mentor, Moses, and the people. Coming as it did on the cusp of this election season, several notable points popped out for me. Preparing leaders to lead takes time. Even the best leaders have their weak points. Different times call for different leaders. And the gracious transfer of authority from one leader to the next is a blessing not only to those who lead, but to those who follow. It's hard to move together to the promised land if you're not working together. It is my hope and prayer that we in our lives as citizens can recognize our mutual goals and principles and will expect the best from our leaders and one another. God be with you till we meet again.